from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Organizations continue to spend more on security with 87% of firms expecting to increase spend on cyber in the next 12 months. But are we any safer? It's estimated that firms on average have between 60 to 75 security tools installed. While leading vendors logically market the benefits of addressing tools sprawl and complexity through consolidation, the data suggests that more than half the firms are increasing the number of security vendors installed with a very small percentage able to affect vendor consolidation. Adding to the challenge is an environment where SecOps pros have too many priorities to manage, ranging from identity, vulnerability management, patching, endpoint, SIM, AV, zero trust, cloud security, and more. And finally, firms are investing in AI innovation in an attempt to relieve the crushing labor burden security analysts are facing. Hello and welcome to this week's The Q Research Insights, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we preview RSA 2024 with our colleague, Eric Bradley of ETR. We'll provide a detailed analysis of a recent survey conducted by ETR in a perfectly timed ahead of RSA. Eric Bradley, welcome to the program. Good to see you, my friend. Always good to see you too. And I want to give you some credit. This wasn't just ETR. We kind of co-did this survey. Your analysts had a lot of input on this one too. So it was great to work together on this one. Love the partnership. Thank you for that. A shout out. So look, security budgets, they're, they're on the rise. This chart here shows data from the most recent ETR survey uh, we referenced at the top. As you can see, N is 321 respondents and the vast majority, 87%, are increasing spending on security with 70% expecting an increase of 5% or more, which is higher than the overall spending, IT spending that we've been reporting on. The other note is that 0% of the Fortune 100 and S&P 500 respondents report that they expect a decrease, none. Eric, what can you add on the survey demographics and any other analysis that and takeaways you have from this data? Yeah, yeah, first of all, no reason to bury the lead. That's just a massive number. One of the two biggest takeaways from this survey for me was just how much higher the data shows that security spending is across all of IT in general. Now, if we're gonna talk a little bit about that breakdown, I do wanna say that more than half of them are saying that spend is going up about from five to 14%, but 14% of all respondents cited spending over 15%, which I'm calling hyper growth. Now we don't bucket what that means. So I'm really curious to know just how high above 15% some of these organizations were alluding to. So this data, even though it already looks so high, could be skewed even higher than we're reporting. And then interestingly on a demographic call out, it's the mid-sized companies, which we uh, account for between 1,200 and around 1,200, 200 and 1,200 employees, 92% of them stated an increase of 23% expecting hyper growth in that bucket. And then conversely, it was the global 2000 that had the lowest number of hyper growth, which obviously makes sense off such high, you know, budget based numbers already. But yeah, th this number was just so much higher than general IT uh, spend across the board. Well, and here's some, some, some little detail on that. You look at multi-cloud and ransomware as big drivers. This data here shows the, the increase in spend and what's, what the, some of the, the catalysts are. And note, it's a, for the audience, it's a double Y axis, okay? So that black line, which is the percent of respondents that are increasing spend minus the percent of, of respondents decreasing spend. But that's actually quite high on the right-hand vertical axis. But multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, big driver and something we've talked about in the past, we talked about super cloud complexity, multiple clouds, because they expand the threat surface. And of course, ransomware protection is top of mind, Eric, and that could be a reason why some of these firms are hyper spending on security. Yeah, great call out on the access number. Even that lowest line is still in the high 30s. And this goes along with a lot what you and I have been saying in the past, that it's hybrid cloud that's really the driving trend right now. We also have separate uh, public cloud growth studies we can dig into another time, but th that data shows that the rate of growth is slowing in the public cloud hyper accelerators where hybrid cloud is really the one that's picking up the momentum here. And we all know that has a lot of ramifications. We're seeing that in security models and spending, as you mentioned, but there are others as well. And then the last quick comment here, I was really surprised to see the lower sc scores in the cyber insurance category because average breach costs continue to increase. 
But when we isolate that to global 2000 responses, that not that number dropped even further from 41% stating it as an increased driver down to only 25%. To me, that's a sign that there's been some rationalization and maturity in this business. And there were a couple of really frenetic years there in the cyber insurance policy world where a lot of the CISOs that I speak to were very upset, kind of dictating what tools they used and how. And the cyber insurance companies didn't really have a great understanding, but we're still kind of pushing it. It's really nice to see that number drop to me because I'm viewing that as we're seeing some maturity in that cyber insurance world finally. Okay, so another big theme, the other big takeaway in the survey is you should consolidate these multiple tools, address tool sprawl, consolidate and simplify, right? Well, this next set of data was eye-opening and the more I dig into it, the more it actually makes sense, but ask most people uh, and, and our organizations increasing or decreasing the number of security tools in their shops and the narrative from very successful security companies like CrowdStrike, Palo Alto, and Zscaler. So despite those comments about spending fatigue last quarter, but at any rate, their narrative would lead you to believe that a lot of shops are successfully consolidating the number of security vendors. Well, they're not. Only 9% say they're decreasing the number of suppliers. And when you double click on that data, only 6% or doing so via consolidation. So I asked folks on Twitter what they thought, and not surprisingly, 52% said they thought the answer would be decreasing, but that is not the case. Now, that said, about a third in my Twitter poll said increasing. So those are probably the practitioners who are on the front lines, but this data is really important. It says that things are gonna get more complex with respect to tool sprawl. What do you think, Eric? Yeah, I mean, you, you nailed it. This is by far the biggest takeaway for us because it was so contrarian. Uh, you even named some of the big names, but we've been hearing in public company earnings calls that consolidation and being a platform play was their strategy going forward. Now, right now, this data is just showing that the end users are on the that are actually on the ground protecting their organizations are still looking to buy the best of breed and build their layers of defense through increasing vendors when necessary. So it's not a knock on the Palos, Sentinels, Crowd, Octas, that that's their strategy, and it just might not be time yet. But right now, I think this was the biggest contrarian data. We still are seeing vendors increase, no, no doubt about it. Okay, and then just sort of following up on that, you know, my premise here is what IT practitioners see. My, my uh, earlier point on the Twitter poll, here's what one IT person said. Quote, decrease implies consolidations, increase implies new entrants. I vote increase not for that binary reason, but because the amount of new entrants exceeds consolidations. So, and what we did, Eric, I, I, uh, we, we superimposed um, the, uh, it's impossible to read chart, but, but that's the point, is coming from ETR's Emerging Technology Survey of privately held companies, and this is the security sector, and you can see how crowded it is. You, with names that are well known. You got One Trust, Beyond Trust, One Password, Nord, Wiz, Sneak, who's rooting a rumor to be going public, Cato, multiple dozens of others, Eric. So I think I think this is the case, is that people are saying, hey, there's some new tools and I need help. And so they gravitate toward them. Yeah, I love that chart. And the, the funny part about that is there's hundreds more that we could include in our emerging technology survey in the security part. We have PEVC firms telling us all the time, you guys got to go earlier. You got to go earlier. I need series A. I need, you know, there can be hundreds more that would make that chart even more confusing. But yes, your point is very well made. There are a ton of early stage companies that are hyper-focused on specific security needs that the large players just really aren't well enough, you know, equipped to handle. Uh, they were born on-prem. They weren't born in container and in service mesh. There's so much more that that can be done. There's API security that we're seeing as interest. It just shows also how right the security sector is for future consolidation and or failures uh, because there's so many out there down the road. But looking at this chart, I, I already see that Lacework and Wiz, maybe we can combine them after that acquisition and make it just a touch less confusing next year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, don't blink <laughs> because there'll be a new, new addition shortly. So let's dig into why they're adding vendors. I found this data interesting. It drills into the question for those respondents saying that they were increasing the number of vendors in their cyber stack, ask them why. And they basically imply, or maybe I should say I infer that existing vendors can't fill the gaps. And they're also implying, or I'm inferring, that large portfolio vendors are not best of breed within specialized sectors. So Eric, this is really interesting to me. And 
And like I say, we can infer from this chart two things. One, there's a long way to go to really attack the tool sprawl issue. Two, customers feel it's worth the added complexity if they can get tools and vendors that are specialized. And I guess I'd add a third. This spells tons of opportunity for the market. Frankly, the, the problem's not being addressed in a comprehensive way by the leading vendors, so that opens the, the gate for new entrants. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, everybody wants one throat to choke. We hear it all the time. It's just not happening right now. I mean, they want fewer vendors, but that desire is not outweighed by the actual security needs that we're handling. Out of that 165 respondents increase and expect the new the need for new vendors to handle new threats and moving towards best of breed, we're both cited at around 36% of them. Uh, and that's really what you're trying to say here, right? There's new threats and I still want best of breed, which means the existing vendor options aren't handling that. There was an additional 27% that stated was actually expanding business initiatives that, that was driving the need for new vendors. So, you know, there are multiple reasons. And as we know, of course, more vendors means more cost as this survey is showing, but it also means complexity to the integration. So there's still a lot to come. And just quickly to really highlight how lopsided this was, it wasn't shown on this slide, Dave. Only 29 respondents stated that they intended to decrease their security vendor stack. That, that's only 29 people entirely. And of those people, it was 25% of them who said that it was budget reasons and the majority was saying that they wanted to simplify. It's that strategy that we're hearing, that people want to simplify the stack and they're going to move away. But out of over 300, only 29 actually confirmed that. I just thought it was a really interesting number. Wow, that, that is fascinating. You know, so Nikesh Arora last quarter on the earnings call uh, used the phrase spending fatigue. And of course, that set off a chain reaction, um, not only by George Kurtz, who on the CrowdStrike earnings call said, well, we're not seeing that. And of course, CrowdStrike crushed its quarter. And then uh, Jay Chaudhry of Zscaler chimed in, he piled on, said the same thing. So it's going to be really interesting to see how it, all, each of those three companies and others, you know, do this quarter. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really curious because you know, supposedly Palo Alto might have another beat on Thunderdome. That's a big reason why why the miss. But this whole idea of vendors not getting as much value out of the, or customers not getting as much value out of the consolidation. This is something I've talked to Zias Caravalla, who was a, another analyst in this space about. And we, we used to talk about Palo Alto. I want to get your opinion on this. The question we pose to each other is, can you be both best of breed and, you know, full broad portfolio? And Zias is premises, you don't have to be if you're Palo Alto. You got to be just good enough. But maybe in security, good enough is not good enough, as some have said. You know, what I would say there is then we wouldn't be seeing what we're seeing with Microsoft and security. Because if you just go back a couple of decades, nobody would have seen Microsoft a security company. Right. right. Then it was, well, no, I'm not going to go near them because they're not best of breed. Now you're hearing, well, they're good enough. So he might be right. Um, personally, I think if I was the CISO and it was my organization on the line, as long as I could afford it, I'm still going to go with the best of breed approach, a layered de de depth of defense approach, than I am going to go with a full stack or platform play. But I guess it is possible to be both because we're watching Microsoft do it right in front of our eyes. All right, let's look at, well, ha have, having said that, if you read the report from the federal government on some of their security fails, well, <laughs> we can park that for now. Okay. Let's take I meant from a, I meant from a spending perspective. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> They're like gobbling up Zika. Well, well, look at look at their earnings today. I mean, uh, you know, from yesterday, it, it, I mean, it doesn't seem like that has had any impact on Microsoft's momentum. But let's take a look at where the priorities are. And this chart, to me, says it all. Frank Sloopman once said to me, if you have 10 priorities, you have none. And this underscores the problem in cyber, in my opinion. You can't, you know, narrow it down to one priority. You got identity, you got single sign-on, MFA, patching, EDR, XDR. We talked about SIM, throw in observability, antivirus, zero trust architectures, you know, <laughs> web application firewall. It's never ending. Eric, what are the CISOs telling you as to how they're managing all these multiple priorities? How do they do it? First of all, they don't sleep very well. Uh, I think we all know that. CISOs don't sleep. But uh, all three, all of these areas are absolutely critical for different reasons. Um, and I just want to state real quickly, ETR has launched a new product called Market Arrays that actually digs into two of these top ones, the granular topics. We've already completed them in identity and endpoint platform. At some point, we can dig into that. But 
Regarding this particular uh, security uh, security observability leading the second tranche of group at 39%, that was something that I thought was really interesting because you're asking about the CISOs calls. A lot of CISOs are talking about security observability right now. They have a lot more, I think, uh, options than they did. It used to just be running everything through Splunk, and our core spending uh, intentions data is showing a lot of volatility in this area, whether it's with Elastic, Datadog, you know, obviously there's others out there as well, um, Cisco acquiring Splunk. So it's actually the security observability area that I'm hearing the most about at the moment, and that might just be because they're, they're worried about ingestion models and actually what to ingest and where. Uh, and giving, finally, they have more options, and I think they're interested in that. One interesting point showed up about this when we were leveraging our job title cut, and that's that among the C-suite level, vulnerability management jumped to the top spot. But among the practitioners, observability jumped into third, and EDR, XDR fell all the way to second, sixth. Excuse me. So I think what's interesting to point out here is it depends on what role you have in your organization, where your priority is. Yeah, so it's kind of showing you that all areas of security are a priority, but there's a big difference between the actual tired SOC analyst doing the job than the suits kind of, you know, kind of pulling the strings. Very interesting. The execs are saying, where, where is my exposure? And the practitioners are saying, help. I, I, I need visibility. Uh, very interesting. You see that a couple of times in this survey. There's a real dissonance right now between the C-suite and the people actually doing it. And that's a recent addition to the ETR thesis. So I'm glad you guys added that. It's just you guys continue to add texture. So thank you. Um, okay. So this is a, I love this next one. This survey. This is a survey of 321 practitioners. 170 plan to attend RSA. So what are they interested in learning about? So this is a great question. And of course, we know it's going to be AI heavy and zero trust. But API security. Eric, you talked about that earlier. Cloud posture management. Uh, DLP, data security, authentication, of course, EDR, XDR, they, that rounds out the top eight. But again, Eric, this is a lot for sec SecOp pros to, to juggle. I don't know how they do it. Yeah, the, the going, that Gen AI is really going to come as fast as it can because these guys have a lot of fatigue. There's no doubt about it. You know, we have a ton of respect for the RSA sh uh, show, so we thought it would be interesting to add some direct RSA trends into this survey. Uh, most interesting to me, uh, API security, very, very high on that list. There are some uh, vendors, as you showed in that really crowded chart, that are dedicated to just that. So I'm going to be curious to follow up at that at the show. The biggest takeaway for me on this one was the data loss prevention and data security management were so low. And then in another part of the survey not shown here, about 35% cited they have absolutely no plans to evaluate data security management, which is just a shocking data point to me. Um, either everyone feels completely secure in their existing data strategy or it's not yet on their radar, but it really should be. Yeah, I, I doubt it's the former, right, that they feel completely secure. But, you know, again, they just, how do you manage all these priorities? You got to tick them off, you know, brick by brick. So picking up on that last chart, digging into the data a little bit, let's start with AI and then we're going to double click into to zero trust. So 22% of respondents are currently spending on AI-related security tools, and another 25% expect to be allocating funds within the next six months, with a big chunk expecting to do so before RSA 2025. Only 17% say they have no plans to spend on AI-related security tools. And I guess maybe that's the most surprising here, Eric, that 17% say they have no plans. I mean, in reality, they're going to be spending, I would presume, on AI tooling but it's going to be embedded into security products. But maybe the intent of this question is explicitly spending on AI-specific tools. What are your thoughts? Yeah, the intent of the question was specific net new spending on AI tools. I'm sure even that 17% are spending on it where it's already embedded somewhere. So this was about net new. Um, but outside of that small group, but what we're seeing here is 22% have already allocated dollars towards it. And 61% plan to do so over the next year, which is really interesting. A lot of runway to go. And although not shown here, the full RSA security study also asked what percentage of tools leverage AI ML technology currently. And the largest response at 47% was that only 1% to 10% of their existing security tools already leverage AI. 26%, that was around 10 to 25%. And only 14% stated that more than quarter of their tools currently have AI embedded with them. 
to me, that was a little bit surprising. So everyone's planning to do so, but the existing amount is still relatively small, suggesting a lot of runway left in AI-related security. Yeah, thank you for that. So, I mean, as you well know, the hype in the market always leads what's really happening in, with the practitioners. And of course, there's a lot of hype around zero trust. That is good hype though. With most of the CISOs that we talk to, they're pursuing some kind of zero trust approach, but it's a long road with a lot of challenges. You got strategic issues, organizational challenges. You got technical aspects related to implementing zero trust architecture. You know, CISOs, you think about CISOs, they got to consider, consider things like regulatory compliance, how to map zero trust into corporate edicts. There's technical issues like, you know, how do you do micro segmentation? Um, you got to worry about authentication. How about, you know, how are you going to measure this stuff with the analytics on an ongoing basis? So, and there's organizational challenges, you know, you got to pay for it. You got to do POCs, you got to test it. You got to put in change management. So it's, it's not a trivial task, but so, I mean, given that it's no surprise that only 11% have, a, have, have deployed a zero trust model. Now that, that actually is pretty, pretty, probably higher than I thought, Eric, but more than three fourths of the respondents are on a zero trust path. What are you seeing? Yeah, very interesting. I mean, this is a term that's extremely mature, uh, but yet we're not seeing the follow through. So I think that's kind of a disconnect here. Like you said, only 11% cited that their organization had one fully deployed. It did seem a touch high to me, and I'd be curious to know how they defined it, but we can get to that another time. However, this was a statistic where we also saw another discrepancy in perception by job title. So the actual practitioners stated 15% actually had fully deployed zero trust. But if you ask the C-suite, that dropped almost in half at 8% said they had one. So again, the actual people doing the work were much higher in their perception of their company having zero trust than the suits were. Now, in general, the majority at 66% either have begun or plan to deploy zero trust versus, as you said, only 24% stating that they don't utilize it at all. So again, very much like we just mentioned with AI-related security, zero trust moving from philosophy to deployment still has a ton of runway left. Awesome. Okay, so let's end on some of the things we're going to watch at, at RSA. First of all, we are at RSA. Uh, we're in Moscone West uh, in Media Row, so the Cube is going to be there. We're also uh, hosting a cocktail party uh, with uh, the New York Stock Exchange and... Intel Capital, uh, as well as uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be there with Elastic and a bunch of the portfolio companies. So more information on that will be coming out the next week. But, but again, let's end on some of the things that we're watching. I'll sort of rattle some off, Eric, and then you can chime in. I'm really interested in how our security spending patterns changing. You know, how do they map to the, the data we just shared? And really how organizations are balancing that need for AI innovation but they got to keep the lights on. So how are they how are they paying for that? Are they stealing from other budgets? We know that approximately 40 plus 42 percent of of organizations tell us they're they're stealing from other budgets to pay for their Gen AI. Of course, when you dig into that data, a lot of that's coming from business lines. So it's not necessarily hitting the IT budget. But I'm, I'm curious to that dynamic. How are firms managing this security tool sprawl? I mean, a lot of people, Eric, are going to question this data and say, no way. But we know that you know, you guys do a fantastic job of vetting these individuals, you know who they are. You know, it's not, it's not a blind survey, you don't reveal who it is, but you guys have close relationships with these folks, so you can double check it, triple check it, you know, and, and, and test it. Um, so we have very high confidence in this. So I wanna learn more about this and ask some of the practitioners that we have on theCUBE what they're thinking and, and what some of their challenges are. And then, you know, how, are this, how is the SecOps analyst experience going to change as a result of AI? These folks are like air traffic controllers, and you know, I'm hopeful that AI can, can help ease some of the pain. And then really, I want to uh, test the vendor narrative uh, against that consolidation narrative, test it against what's really happening in the marketplace. So those are some of the things that I had on my mind. Eric, what are you looking for? Uh, great points. Um, some of them the same. I do want to just quickly, if I can, touch upon your comment about um, the anonymity of our data. Uh, uh, we certainly, due to PII and our huge thousands and thousands of IT decision makers in our in our network, uh, we will never reveal any of that. But 
one way to kind of prove that is we also have an expert network. So people do calls with them, just like a GLG. So you do. there are real people on the other end of these that you can reach out to, do custom research, custom surveys, or just direct one-on-one -on -one calls. They're also the ones that populate our panels. So yes, uh, we audit them carefully. Uh, it is the foundation of everything we do. ETR wouldn't exist without them. So I just felt like I really needed to touch upon that. But uh, as far as what I'm interested in, you know, we asked the other people that are attending what their favorite RSA tracks are. Hackers and threats were number one. Cloud security was very closely behind. Uh, right now, I'm doing a big study of market array on the CNAP and CSM, CSPM space. That's going to come out in early June. For me, I'm really interested in getting out there, hearing what the real buyers have to say about this emerging cloud security market, how they're kind of converging. Uh, one of the other things I love about RSA for me is it kind of is aligned with ETR and the fact that it happens right smack in the middle of earnings, right? And there's going to be a lot of companies that have reported but are still yet to report. Uh, I think a lot of the companies sandbagged a little bit last quarter. You know, they kind of macro environment, added a little de-risk to their valuations, hopefully setting up for what could be incremental raises to full year guides going forward. I'm not so sure that's going to happen right now because of everything you said. We'll see. Last quarter, there was a lot of great numbers. So far, we're seeing stock reactions not as high. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. And then just in general, I love the mix of tech companies, end users, buyers, and investors that attend RSA. Uh, it's a lot of what we do here at ETR, so it's just the perfect spot for us. So I'm super excited to really hear what the end users are doing, meet with some of our community members, uh, and looking forward to a live session with you uh, once or twice while we're out there too, Dave. Awesome, yeah, we're definitely gonna schedule that. Uh, and as I say, we got the cocktail party Monday night with NICE, Open Policy, uh, Intel Capital, and, and Elastic. That's, uh, that's from 5 to 7 p.m. It's at Lamar. Um, Lamar Kachina Purana, which is uh, on the pier. So that's going to be awesome. A lot of CISOs are going to be there. So uh, if you're interested, reach out. Uh, and and as in, again, we're at Moscone West, uh, which is a very short walk from north and south. So less than five minutes right there. We're on Media Row. So, so stop by and see us. Eric, thank you so much. Awesome data. Great timing. Can't wait to be hanging with you in uh, San Francisco. Yeah, see you. See you very soon. Okay, that's it for now. Thank you to Alex Meyerson, who's on production, and Ken Schiffman. Alex also does our podcast. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hoth is our EIC over at SiliconAngle.com. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts wherever you listen. Just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. Publish each week on TheCubeResearch.com and SiliconAngle.com. You can email me at David.Vellante at SiliconAngle.com or DM me at DVellante. Comment on our LinkedIn post and by all means, check out etr.ai. They get the best survey data in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for Eric Bradley and the Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.